Good morning. The Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia will now come to order. I want to welcome Ranking Member Chaffetz, members of the Subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the effectiveness of residential reentry centers or halfway houses on public safety, prisoner reentry, and recidivism in the nation's capital. Uh, the Chair, Ranking Member, and Subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will submit, excuse me, all members will have five days to submit statements for the record. Ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to today's Subcommittee Oversight Hearing on the Utilization and Effectiveness of Bureau of Prison Sponsored Halfway Houses in the District of Columbia, also commonly referred to as Community Correction Centers. Halfway houses play a critical role in federal corrections policy, yet this important phase of an ex-offender's road to recovery and reentry often goes unrecognized, unregulated, and in the case of the district at times, underused. According to the Bureau of Prisons Program and Policy Statement on Community Correction Centers, whenever possible, eligible inmates are to be released to the community through a CCC, a Community Correction Center, unless, of course, there exists a reasonable impediment it is estimated that every year nearly 2,500 ex-offenders return to the district after completing their sentences. There is an average of five ex-offenders per day, and with many inmates regularly returning to the district, it's imperative that the Bureau of Prisons and its halfway houses providers are equipped and adequately prepared to help these individuals successfully transition from confinement to community. To that end, today's hearing is intended to ascertain how well the Bureau and its partners are doing in meeting that objective. Currently, the district is home to three BOP Bureau of Prisons. I will try to reduce the number of acronyms, uh, that, we, excuse me, acronyms that we use uh, during the hearing, but it's unavoidable, apparently. Uh, currently, the district is home to three Bureau of Prison affiliated halfway houses. Hope Village in Ward 8, efforts from ex-convicts in Ward 2, and Fairview, the district's only halfway house for women in Ward 7. And I'm glad to have both the BOP officials and representatives from each of these particular centers here with us this morning to help us get an update uh, on the role that halfway houses are playing in reducing crime and recidivism in the nation's capital. Since adoption of the Re Revitalization Act in 1997, and the massive restructuring of D.C.'s criminal justice system, both the city and the federal government have worked diligently and collaboratively to increase public safety by implementing sound felon reentry systems and practices. Halfway houses serve as an instrument element, excuse me, an instrumental element of this overall approach and therefore warrant serious and ongoing oversight. I'd like to thank the gentlelady from the District of Columbia the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton for continuing to place an emphasis on prisoner reintegration issues and for recommending today's hearing. I look forward to the testimonies of our invited witnesses and now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, for any opening remarks he may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Eleanor Holmes Norton for uh, her work on this and her uh, encouraging this hearing to happen. happen. I, I, I do support uh, the idea and the notion that supposed to be the Department of Corrections, and that pathway back is an important one, and, and glad we're diving into that today. This particularly, particular hearing provides an excellent opportunity to discuss the Federal Bureau of Prisons and its relationship to halfway houses in the District of Columbia. The Bureau of Prisons is vested with the authority to house D.C. Code felons under the National Capital, Capital Revitalization Act, and upon release, most convicts are automatically housed in BOP-based halfway houses in D.C. under the jurisdiction of the Court Services and Offender Super, Supervisi, Supervision Agency, CSOSA. The National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997 fundamentally restructured the relationship and responsibilities between the federal government and the district government, including its courts, prisons, and parole supervision. The district's Lorton Correction Facility in Virginia, which had housed D.C. code felons, was closed in 2001. This resulted in such convicts being placed in various Bureau of Prisons throughout the, throughout the country. CSOSA, which supervises D.C. ex-convicts, is also a federal entity. 
I would specifically like to learn about how the Bureau of Prisons and CSOSA work together to curb recidivism rates. We all want ex-offenders to return safely to their communities, and halfway houses are critical to the success in this effort. A good halfway house can help save lives. They can provide a safe place where someone can learn the skills and get the tools they need to learn to live in a healthy lifestyle. Halfway House is a transitional facility. It is needed to ease the difficult task of going back from prison or drug recovery straight back into the community. Ex-offenders can best succeed if they are sober, employed, and have a good place to live. Otherwise, they're highly likely to go through the revolving door of the criminal justice system, something nobody wants to have happen. Again, Mr. Chairman and uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, I, I thank you both for uh, holding this hearing and, and uh, insisting that it happen, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to uh, simply summarize my testimony and ask that it be put in the record. Uh, only to emphasize, uh, Mr. Chairman, first, the, my uh, sincere appreciation for this hearing. There has not been a hearing involving halfway houses now for almost 10 years. Uh, and yet, uh, these houses are or should be critical to reentry. Uh, I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, because we're dealing with a fairly uh, complicated uh, agency here. These, these are local D.C. code offenders, yet they're in a federal prison. And SOSA, the Court Services Offender and Service Agency, is, of course, a federal agency. So it requires some coordination and understanding of what is a unique, um, a, a, a unique, um, a, 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 a unique situation in our federal system, where essentially BOP is a state prison system for the District of Columbia, yet is a federal agency with federal rules. Um, we are very concerned that uh, the 6,500 D.C. code felons are now spread. Uh, to 75 BOP facilities in 33 states. You can't run a state prison system that way. And I will be looking, Mr. Chairman, for uh, a, a solution to, to that problem. Uh, we don't understand precisely what the effect of these halfway houses uh, is on the most important part of their mission, which is reducing recidivism and public safety. I will be particularly interested, Mr. Chairman, uh, to learn uh, this morning as much as I can about those two issues, and I thank you very much again for this hearing. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I take great interest in this hearing. I, um, uh, as a resident of the inner city of Baltimore and as one who uh, used to voluntarily run an aftercare program uh, for uh, young men who were being released from our um, juvenile facilities. It's, um, I take tremendous uh, interest in this subject. And so therefore, I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank Ms. Norton for all that she uh, has done in regard to these kinds of issues and so many others. I've said to many people many times that um, she is one of the finest public servants I know, uh, working tirelessly to address so many, many issues of the district. Ex-offenders need help to make a smooth transition into day-to-day -day civilian life. Once they make that transition, they have the potential to serve as critical resources to our communities, acting as mentors, mentors to our young people, and working to unravel the same criminal network to which they once belong. While the nation's crime rates have fallen over the last decade, there has been an unprecedented explosion in prison and jail populations. Upwards of 650,000 men and women are released from state and federal prisons each year, and an even large, larger number of people are being released from our local jails. In my hometown of Baltimore, approximately 700 to 800 former prisoners are reentering our neighborhoods from prison every month. Unfortunately, we are failing to integrate far too many of these returning neighbors into the economic and social life of our communities. Nearly two-thirds of released uh, prisoners are expected 
to be rearrested for a felony or serious misdemeanor within three years of release. Such high recidivism rates translate into thousands of new crimes each year, at least half of which can be averted through improved prisoner reentry efforts. And I might add that it is not, when I return to my district, it is not unusual, Mr. Chairman, for me to be approached by anywhere from five to six people a day who tell me something like this. Mr. Cummings, uh, I've just gotten out of prison. Oh, I've been out for a few months. I simply cannot find a job, cannot find opportunity. And if, and if, if you can't help me, then I'm going to have to do something. And what they mean by that is that they're going to have to commit a crime. This is the real deal. To survive, that is. And I'm certainly not sitting here saying that's a, excusing them for that. I just want us to be aware of that. Uh, these programs have to address the issues of education, housing, treatment, training, and employment. In these economic times, it's very difficult when you look at it from the, the employment standpoint. The, when we had our uh, a jobs uh, fair just recently, Mr. Chairman, we had a number of people who came through, and one of their major complaints was that nobody uh, wanted to, the people with records, that is, said nobody wanted to give them an interview. And I tried to make them realize that for every person who had a record, there were probably a hundred who didn't have a record who were trying to get the same job. So, and a lot of employers just don't want to hear uh, from anybody who has a record. Um, and so they face a very difficult situation. Reentry programs such as halfway houses or community correction centers produce successful outcomes for our communities and our citizens. I'm proud to have been one of the original co-sponsors of the Second Chance Act of 2007, which is now law that extended the amount of time that prisoners can stay in a halfway house from six months to one year. Today we examine the unique prisoner reentry program here in the District of Columbia. The D.C. Code felons are being housed at, in 75 different facilities located in 33 states, meaning that they are not able to visit with social workers, clergy, friends, and family which are crucial in preparing the prisoner for reentry into their own community. And so, Mr. Chairman, as my time runs out, I ask that my entire statement be uh, placed in the record, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and without objection, his, his uh, remarks and uh, his statement will be submitted to the record. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Kucinich for five minutes. When we think about crime and punishment, our society still doesn't have it right because there is no way that we can appreciably affect recidivism if we don't make sure that when people try to come back and participate in society that there's a place for them. We're asking people to do something impossible. And when you look at it in a larger context, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to leave her to go over to a meeting with uh, Secretary Solis, who's talking about jobs right now. We have 15 million Americans without any jobs. And in that market, you get released from prison, you try to find a job, it's harder than ever. So halfway houses sometimes leave people just halfway. And if, you're going to go to, if you want to get the full distance, then a society has to be there with an opportunity. We can't keep condemning people for going back to prison if we don't have a place for them in our society. And, we, and it's famous that we have one of the largest prison populations in the world. And per capita, we're one of the highest in the world. It's really a commentary on our society. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I come from a, a family in Cleveland, Ohio, that some members of our family had some tough times. 
and some of them did time. And maybe if they'd had better lawyers, they wouldn't have done time. But they did time. And when they came back, it was very tough for them to find a way to get back into the system. Very tough. So I, I want to thank the people who are involved in this effort to try to really give individuals an opportunity to be able to rescue their lives. But we've got to have solid economic components, and you just can't be expected to do this on your own. It's called a halfway house. You can, you can meet people halfway, but our society has to do something about helping people get the entire distance. Um, I really am grateful for those who have dedicated their time and effort to the endeavors in the district. I hope that we'll be able to address some of the issues of people being able to see their loved ones who are incarcerated, sometimes at a great distance from the district. And uh, I hope we'll be able to do something about some of the issues of oversight of uh, the houses that are uh, essentially operated by private contractors. So I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. The committee will now hear from today's witnesses after a brief introduction. It is committee policy that all witnesses are to be sworn uh, before testifying. So may I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reveal that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, your entire statements will be uh, included in the record. A little bit about the uh, ground rules here. You'll see a small box in front of you. You might want to turn that one around so we can, the witness can actually see the. Uh... Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, when the uh, the green light will indicate that you have five minutes to summarize your statement. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining to sort of wrap up your statement. And the red light indicates that your time has expired. And you should immediately uh, summarize and end your statement. Uh, I'd like to introduce today's panel. Uh, Mr. Louis Eichenlaub serves as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for the Bureau of Prisons. Regional Director Eichenlaub joined the Bureau of Prisons in 1986 as a research analyst in the Office of Research and Evaluation in Information Policy and Public Affairs Division in the Central Office here in Washington, D.C. Ms. Adrienne Poteet was named as the Acting Director for Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency in July 2008. In this position, Ms. Poteet oversees a federal agency of nearly 1,300 employees which was created by the D.C. Revitalization Act of 1997 to improve public safety through active community supervision for ex-offenders. Ms. Nancy Levine is the current director of the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Ms. Levine is an expert on crime prevention and prisoner reentry and is the founding director of the U.S. Department of Justice Mapping and Analysis for Public Safety Program. Mr. Charles Reynolds is currently CEO of the Fairview Adult Rehab Center, the only all-female all community corrections center in Washington, D.C. In addition, the Fairview Center, in, in addition, the Fairview Center, Mr. Reynolds also operates a reentry facility in the Hampton Roads area on behalf of Rehabilitation Services, Inc. Both sites uh, incorporate state-of-the-art rehabilitation and correctional residential services. Mr. Jeffrey Verone is CEO of Hope Village, a nationally accredited community correction center which has been providing offender reentry services since 1977. Mr. Verone has, has over 25 years of experience in the field of community corrections and in residential reentry programs. Mr. Michael White is a third generation Washingtonian and former DC code offender. Mr. White was incarcerated at Petersburg Prison from June 2007 until October 2008 and thereafter he was a resident of Hope Village Halfway House from October 2008 until January 2009. I want to thank all of the uh, witnesses for their willingness to come before this subcommittee and, and help us with our work. Uh, Mr. Eichenlaub, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. 
Good morning, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of Bureau of Prisons Director Lappin to discuss the role of residential reentry centers or halfway houses in the District of Columbia. As Regional Director for the Bureau of Prisons Mid-Atlantic Region, I am well aware of the unique role that we play in the District of Columbia. While the number of inmates sentenced in D.C. Superior Court is relatively small compared to our entire inmate population, which is less than 3 percent, we devote substantial resources to ensuring they receive appropriate care and treatment. And, mindful of the unique relationship between the federal government and the District of Columbia, as an organization we work hard to maintain a variety of collaborative relationships with the local criminal justice community. The mission of our agency is to house offenders in institutions that are safe, secure, humane, cost efficient, and provide opportunities for offenders to prepare for a successful return to the community. There are two corollaries to this mission. First, offenders come to prison as punishment, not for punishment, and reentry begins on the first day of an inmate's incarceration. In coming into the federal prison system, District of Columbia offenders have available to them a broad variety of opportunities for self-improvement. Every federal prison offers inmate programs that stress the development of work skills and life skills needed to enhance employment upon release and to help inmates maintain a crime-free lifestyle. These programs include work, education, vocational training, substance abuse treatment, observance of faith and religion, psychological services and counseling, release preparation, and other programs that impart essential life skills. <coughs> Rigorous research has found that inmates who participate in programs are less likely to commit future crimes. For example, inmates who participate in federal prison industries are 24 percent less likely to recidivate and substantially less likely to engage in misconduct. Inmates who participate in vocational or occupational training are 33 percent less likely to recidivate. Inmates who participate in education programs are 16 percent less likely to recidivate. Inmates who complete the BOP's residential substance abuse program, which includes a community transition component and is available at the Rivers Correctional Institution, are 16 percent less likely to recidivate and 15 percent less likely to relapse to drug use within three years after release. We recognize that as inmates approach release, there are, are a variety of immediate needs to address. Through the release preparation program, we provide assistance in resume writing and job seeking and retention skills. We have employment resource centers at all of our institutions. We offer mock job fairs where inmates learn job interview techniques and community recruiters learn of the skills available among inmates. During these events, qualified inmates are afforded the opportunity to apply for jobs with companies that have job openings. Finally, our staff help inmates secure identification, apply for benefits, compile education and training certificates, diplomas, transcripts, and other significant documents needed in the community. Community-based programs, or halfway houses, complement the Bureau's reentry efforts described above. Research has shown that inmates who release through halfway houses are more likely to be employed and less likely to recidivate. For this reason, the BOP places most inmates in community-based programs for the final portion of their term of imprisonment to help offenders gradually readapt to their community environment. Many of the programs and treatment that offenders receive in the correctional institutions are reinforced during their stay in the community-based programs. Additionally, offenders receive assistance in finding a job and a place to live and access to services they may need following release. The BOP does not operate any halfway houses. Rather, all of them are operated by private providers under contract with the BOP. We are committed to ensuring that our programs, including halfway houses, build upon the body of knowledge about what is effective in reducing recidivism. For halfway houses, these evidence-based practices are articulated in our statement of work. Halfway houses must, one, conduct an assessment to identify the crime-producing behaviors to target, two, develop an individualized case plan based on the assessment, three, offer effective interventions, and four, implement the program consistently. We regularly monitor our contracts for RRC services, frequently visiting both Hope Village and Fairview in the district. We work closely with the providers, as well as the staff from the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, to refine our operations and those of the providers. I look forward to hearing from our partners in the D.C. criminal justice community today and to continue to collaborate on how best to address the needs of the district and its incarcerated population. Chairman Lynch, this concludes my formal statement. 
Again, I thank you, Mr. Chaffetz, and the subcommittee for your support of our agency. I would be pleased to answer any questions you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Poteet, you now recognize for five minutes. Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today for, before you and testify on behalf of the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency to discuss the role of halfway houses and in reducing crime and recidivism in the District of Columbia. CISOSA was certified as a federal agency in 2000 and charged with the unique responsibility of supervising men and women on probation, parole, supervised release in the District of Columbia. On any given day, we supervise 16,000 offenders, 6,000 of whom are on probation, parole, or supervised release, and have served a period of incarceration in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Each year, approximately 2,400 offenders return to the District of Columbia from BOP facilities. The demographic profile of the returning offender suggests enormous challenges for us. In FY 2009, 44 percent of them had a history of violent crime, 70 percent had a history of substance abuse, 30 percent had a diagnosed mental health illness, and nearly 40 percent did not have a GED or high school diploma. These offenders arrive in the District of Columbia with an immediate need to find housing and employment services, to develop positive social networks and reconnect with their families. They also have needs in mental health and medical services. The challenge is compounded for offenders released after long periods of incarceration in the Bureau of Prison facilities. And sometimes, once they are released, their support networks have been dissolved. CISOSA created a specialized unit to deal with the offenders coming from the Bureau, and that's a transitional intervention team called TIPS. We work solely with the offenders returning from prison. The TIPS CSOs begin this transition period six months prior to the offender returning to the community. They investigate home and employment plans prepared by the BOP case managers. They ensure that the pro proposed plans for home and employment are successful for reentry into the community and do not pose a risk to a prior victim or, in the case of sex offenders, children living in the home. Offenders who transition through a halfway house undergo a comprehensive risk and needs assessment by the TIPS CSOs. This includes a substance abuse history, criminal behavior pa um, patterns, history of violence, educational or vocational deficits, physical or mental health challenges. Armed with this information, the TIPS CSO develops an individualized plan for each offender. During the course of a halfway house stay, an offender may be enrolled in Unity Health Care, be referred to Goodwell Industries for job placement, receive skills from opportunities, industrialization centers, and be connected to a mentor from an area faith-based program. The offender will also be oriented to his supervision requirements. Unfortunately, of the 2,400 offenders who will return to the district, Last year, only 40 percent of them trans uh, transitioned through halfway house. This average stay for our CISOS offenders was 45 to 60 days. Our experience suggests that a longer period of stay may be effective in stabilizing offenders during this critical period. In general, offenders who experience halfway house placements are 20 to 40 percent more likely to find themselves in stable employment and housing during their 180-day stay prior and may be, and some of them are considered to be our riskiest population. Employment and housing stability have long been associated with greater supervision compliance. Research conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics in 2002 supports the need for a comprehensive strategy for addressing offender needs during the first 180 days after release from prison. That study found that the offenders are at a greater risk of committing new crimes or serious supervision violations. Excuse me prior to being sent back to prison during the first six months in the community. 
Of the nearly 68 percent of the offenders who will be arrested, rearrested during three years of their release, less than half of them will be arrested during the first 180 days. Clearly, this is the most critical intervention period to slow down the likelihood of the offender reoffending. Now, I'd like to just turn your attention to a uh, immediate challenging facing CSOSA, we will have approximately 500 offenders that will be returning to the district based on um, U.S. Parole Commission in a correctly applying parole guidelines to these men and women that were D.C. offenders that were sentenced during the 187 um, to 185, 1985 to, um, time for drug offenses, and it was the uh, epidemic of the crack. And so therefore, some of them have spent more than 10 years in the prison system and will probably come home with a lot of challenges that they will be facing at that time. And so therefore, we will be working very closely with our partners to address those needs for those men and women returning to the District of Columbia. In closing, CISOSA has been collaborating with our criminal justice partners, researchers, and academics to develop strategies to reverse the pattern of recidivism. That consistent theme emerging from our shared work is that the offender reentry must begin before inmates leave prison, and intervention services must be front-loaded. Halfway houses accomplish this goal. We look forward to continuing our close collaboration with the Bureau of Prisons, our halfway houses providers, and other local and federal partners to enhance public safety while also reducing recidivism. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and will be open to any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poteet. Ms. Levine, you're now recognized for five minutes. Yes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the role of halfway houses in transitioning people from prison to the community. I am director of the Justice Policy Center at the Urban Institute. The bulk of our research is on prisoner reentry, and for good reason. The successful transition of people returning home from prison is critical, not only for them, but for the safety and well-being of their families and the communities to which they return. Yet the path to successful reentry is rarely a smooth one. People exiting prison face tremendous challenges to leading sober and law-abiding lives on the outside. Few have housing or jobs lined up, and many struggle with substance abuse, health problems, and mental illness. While they may have received treatment, training, or assistance behind bars, far too often prisoners are released without the support and services critical to their successful reintegration. Prisoners returning home to the district face an additional challenge of having been incarcerated sometimes hundreds of miles away from their families and potential employers. They return home in need of health care, drug treatment, jobs, and importantly, safe and affordable shelter. That's where halfway houses come in. When designed and operated well, halfway houses can serve as a nurturing way station easing what would otherwise be a stark transition from the prison environment to the free world. Now, I wish I could tell you that halfway houses are a definitive success in reducing recidivism, but it's just not that clear cut. For every study that finds that halfway houses are effective, another one finds that they have no effect at all. Why is that? Well, I think it's because not all halfway houses are created equal. Some house only low-risk inmates, while others welcome inmates of all risk levels. Some offer a full complement of programs and services, while others function strictly as work release centers. These variations in populations and services are, I think, what explains the mixed findings in the research on their effectiveness. In fact, the most definitive evaluation of halfway houses suggests that medium and high-risk residents are most likely to benefit from living in these homes demonstrating a significantly lower likelihood of reoffending than matched comparison groups that do not transition through halfway houses. What's really interesting is that the same study found that low-risk residents using halfway houses actually have higher rates of recidivism than comparison groups. What this means is that housing low-risk prisoners in transitional facilities takes them out of the environment that makes them low-risk to begin with. Research has also found that the type and quality of programs in halfway houses make a big difference in preventing reoffending. 
Effective halfway house programs have qualified staff who use such evidence-based practices as needs assessment and tailored wraparound services. So what does this mean for the district? Well, as we know, less than half of the prisoners, close but less than half of the prisoners returning to DC transition through residential reentry centers, DC's term for halfway houses. This uh, raises some questions that the committee may seek answers to, and I, I'm pleased to observe that some of these questions have already been answered in the affirmative by the previous witnesses. They include, are the right people housed in the halfway houses? Are risk assessment tools used to ensure that medium and high-risk prisoners, those most likely to benefit, end up filling those beds? Do the centers assess the needs of their residents? Do they target services to those needs? Do they hire and retain well-trained, experienced staff? Do they engage in self-evaluation of the quality and effectiveness of their programs? These measures will enable the district to yield the best possible public safety impact from its halfway houses. DC's halfway houses are a scarce but potentially valuable resource in improving prisoner reentry, reducing recidivism, and increasing public safety in the nation's capital. I urge this committee to ensure that these facilities are used as effectively as possible to make the most of their potential for successful prisoner reentry and improve public safety. Thank you for your time. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Levine. Mr. Reynolds, you now recognize for five minutes. Sorry. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to appear before this august body to discuss the role of halfway houses play in reducing crime and recidivism in the nation's capital. Collaborate on alleviating the problems that face returning females, citizens, and providing what we believe are some viable solutions. I'm especially grateful to Congresswoman Norton for her support of community reentry programs uh, in the District of Columbia. Thank you, Ms. Norton, for your continued work on behalf of those clients whom much of society tends to forget or ignore. Your visit to the Fairview on March 30, 2009 was truly an inspiration to the residents that we serve and the staff that supports your reentry efforts. Reynolds and Associates operates a 60-bed residential of a center known as Fairview, located in the District of Columbia, the only female facility of its kind serving returning female citizens under the authority of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We serve more than 1,000 returning females annually. This testimony focused specifically upon those clients who are under the authority of BOP and housed in a residential dormitory type facility with 24-hour supervision. Upon arrival at the Fairview, the residents are assessed and then placed into the appropriate counseling, educational, vocational, and job placement programs. As a result of these assessments, several issues have been identified. Approximately 70% of the clients have mental health issues. Half of that number relies on prescribed medications, and roughly 30% suffer from physical ailments, with the most common being asthma, allergies, diabetes, and hypertension. Approximately 30% of the clients are either HIV positive or have full-blown AIDS, and a significant number of them are recovering from some form of substance abuse. Approximately 20% of the residents are housed with family members upon release who are not always fully prepared for the issues that might occur when their loved one comes to live with them after having been gone for so long. Unfortunately, too many of our clients are homeless and many of the programs that offer transitional housing have long waiting lists and far too many are released to shelters rather than stable environments that would contribute significantly to their successful reentry. <clears throat> In the current economy, many highly qualified individuals are entering the job market and taking jobs that were previously filled by our clients. Therefore, despite the fact that our Reynolds and Associates as a full employment placement specialist who provides job skills, 
job readiness training, GED, and computer skills courses, only about 5% of our clients are currently employed. When a client is released from Fairview, there's no process of tracking their progress and provide additional case management services for them. A significant number of the BOP residents indicate that they would benefit from post-release case management, which could assist them in not returning to prison. Some of the proposed solutions are placing a psychologist or a psychiatrist and a nurse practitioner at the facility and providing comprehensive dental care, providing for enhanced on-site substance abuse counseling in addition to community aftercare component to aggressively address their addictive behavior, include family members in more activities to enhance communications, especially where their children are involved and custodial concerns are present, enhance partnerships with tran transitional housing providers to increase housing availability for the returning citizens, and a need for more incentives for partnerships with local employers to encourage and reward employers that provide job-specific training so that a resident is able to move into a position before immediately after and after release, providing some post-release tracking for at least 18 months so that post-release issues could be regularly addressed, and establishing a mentoring program that collaborates with the case managers to assure that the aftercare needs of the clients are addressed and monitored after release. In conclusion, I ask that you thoroughly read this testimony in order to assess the full impact of the issues on returning females to the district. In addition, if additional services are mandated and funded to meet the unique needs of the female citizens returning, returning to the district, it is our sincere belief that recidivism can be significantly reduced and that our overwhelming majority of our clients, your constituents, can become good, productive citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Verone, you're now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Lynch and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss the effectiveness of residential reentry centers or halfway houses <coughs> on public safety, prisoner reentry, and recidivism in the nation's capital. Of course, I will be speaking from experience we have garnered over the past 30 years at Hope Village, Inc., helping offenders reintegrate into the Washington, D.C. community. Hope Village is a private adult community correction center, also known as a community-based residential reentry re center located in southeast Washington, D.C. Since 1977, Hope Village has provided transitional services to offenders to assist their transition and positive reintegration back into the Washington, D.C. society. The Bureau of Prisons awarded Hope Village the first private pilot community correctional center program in 1982 to house offenders returning to the Washington, D.C. area. This program became so successful that other similar programs are operating in many other areas within the United States. Currently, Hope Village has two contracts with the BOP, serving offenders re-entering the community in the Washington, D.C. area who are generally referred for placement within six months of the remainder of their sentence. Both contracts are performance-based and for a period of 10 years, which includes a three-year base period and seven additional award term slash option years. We also have a contract with the District of Columbia Department of Corrections to serve offenders who are pretrial inmates, court-ordered misdemeanor, and sentenced misdemeanor inmates. Hope Village is the second largest employer in Ward 8 of the District of Columbia. Hope <coughs> Village employs 104 dedicated full-time staff to facilitate our program and provide comprehensive transitions, transition services to offenders. Our staff includes a senior operations director, two program directors, 35 charge of quarters, eight case managers, five vocational counselors, two certified substance abuse counselors, and four social workers. Within our facility, we operate separate departments for correctional services, training, programs, computer services, personnel, facility maintenance, and food service. 
Our very low offender recidivism rate is a tangible testament to the effectiveness of our programs for offender reintegration. In 2009, we reported 1,157 positive offender releases into the community. Of all the offenders who participated in our programs in 2009, only nine were rearrested, which is statistically <coughs> insignificant given the total offender population. Historically, Hope Village has been a work release program where participating offenders were required to secure employment as part of their placement at Hope Village and transition into the community. Hope Village has adopted to changes in the community and the employment market and has tailored its program to meet the evolving needs and goals of program participants. Each week, Hope Village accepts approximately 25 to 30 new offenders from various federal prisons to participate in the Hope Village program. Every offender is required to complete a seven-day orientation to the facility, including an orientation class, assessments for medical and mental health issues, a 12-hour mandatory life skills program covering topics relating to substance abuse, job readiness, health awareness, life safety, financial management, parenting, and computer skills. Uh, offenders must complete the orientation program before they are allowed any movement outside of the Hope Village premises. Offenders are required to attend the orientation class within 24 hours of their arrival at Hope Village. During this orientation, the offender meets with representatives from Hope Village, the Bureau of Prisons, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, to review the, reg to review the regulations and rules of Hope Village. <coughs> that we previously sent to the offender while he was at a federal institution. The representatives are available to discuss the rules and procedures and to answer any questions that the offender may have about the program or his time at Hope Village. This meeting is critical to ensure offenders understand their obligations during their participation in program and the serious consequences of rule violations, which can include a recommendation for the return to the federal institution or extended services. During the first week of arrival, each offender meets with a program review team consisting of his program director, case manager, vocational counselor, social worker, drug treatment provider, and a CISOSA representative. Our program staff closely monitor this individualized plan and review it every two weeks to assess the offender's progress or lack thereof and where necessary address implementation of additional strategies to meet the offender program goals. At Hope Village, we know that employment plays a large part of evaluating an offender's self-esteem and a key factor to reducing recidivism. As such, we take it our priority and place a minimum, a place a premium, excuse me, on assisting federal offenders with their employment needs. Whether this involves improving their skills by sending offenders to specific job training programs like Project Empowerment or referring them to off-site career centers. Given that many of the offenders come to Hope Village after lengthy periods of incarceration, they are long disconnected from the workforce, and some never had a record of employment before incarceration. Moreover, many offenders do not have basic forms of identification, such as a social security card, birth certificate, driver's license, or even a picture identification card. For Mr. Barron, yes. you've, you've grossly exceeded the allotted time, and I notice you have a lot more uh, to go there. Could you please wrap up and, and we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Sure, Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the public safety and accountability. Offenders are referred to Hope Village remain under the supervision of the Attorney General. Uh, therefore, we take our direction and enforce our guidelines set by the government. Um, on the facility grounds, where they, we account for the residents or, or inmates every hour, approximately every hour. Uh, FUSOSA is a valuable partner with us. We have uh, uh, at least weekly the Hope Village staff and CISOSA conduct intake and orientation. Um, we have found an active engagement with the community plays a pivotal role in deterring crime and maintaining public safety for the past 20 years. We have, we have formed a significant partnership with the local community to improve the overall quality of our life and offenders through supports from citizens, local elected officials, and religious leaders. We collaborate with four faith-based organizations, Faith Tabernacle, Alum, AME Church, 
Samaritan Ministries and Congress like the United, United Methodist Church. Mr. Varon, I'm going to accept your full statement into the record. You don't need to read it, sir. Thank Could you. Could you please uh, sum, sum up, please? Thank sure. you. Sure. In addition, Mr. Chairman, Hope Village pledges to continue to work closely and cooperate with our contractors, BOP, DC Department of Correction, CISOSA, and the community to deliver quality and meaningful programs and services to offenders at the point of reentry, re therefore fulfilling our mission statement changes lives. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, and members of the subcommittee to provide this statement, and we welcome the opportunity to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Verone. And your entire statement will be accepted into the record, and we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. White. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Lynch, Congresswoman Norton, and other esteemed members of the subcommittee. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak at this uh, public hearing on halfway houses in the District of Columbia. Um, I feel that my firsthand experience may be something that, you know, a lot of times gets swept under the rug or not, you know, shed you know, good light on. Um, so I'm glad to be able to offer that today. And I also find it fortuitous to be sitting behind Mr. Verone because he was able to shed some light on a few of the issues that I will be uh, addressing. Um, I arrived at Hope Village on October 7, 2008, after having served a sentence at FCC Petersburg in Hopewell, Virginia. Um, this was my first and only stay in a halfway house, and it was my expectation that it would be a way for me to transition smoothly back into society. Um, I was processed fairly quickly after I got there and immediately shuffled to my quarters. Um, a converted two-bedroom apartment, which I shared with seven other men. Uh, later in the week, I was classified by the appropriate staff and informed of their expectations of me, including uh, rules and regulations, the set number of in-house classes or life skills courses I would have to complete before being able to seek employment or visit my family or even receive visitation from my family, um, money I would have to pay from each check, uh, paycheck, and also the appropriate channels I would need to navigate in order to begin job hunting and uh, what have you. It seemed to be a very straightforward program, and I assumed that if I followed these things set before me, everything would be pretty simple and plain, um, painless. I fulfilled my life skills course hours and was granted a pass of several hours to obtain a non-driver's identification card. Shortly thereafter, I began seeking employment in various hospitals and private health care offices since that was my background. I set up interviews and after following the appropriate avenues, had very little trouble obtaining approval to go to my interviews. Um, Despite my professionalism, appearance, and experience, I was turned down several times due to the fact that I am a convicted felon. I was finally able to find a private internal medicine office in Fairfax, Virginia, that was willing to look past what was on paper and hire me. I explained to them immediately um, in my interview um, you know, my situation and gave them a few details about my, uh, the circumstances surrounding my incarceration. I explained to them that even my start date would ultimately be determined by their communication with Ms. Wilson, the job co coordinator in my particular building. Um, I had a very rigid time that I was allowed to leave Hope Village based on a rough calculation by the job coordinator, uh, not really factoring in unexplained or unplanned deviation from the route, maybe trains shutting down, late buses, missed buses, what have you, and being so far away from Hope Village and traveling by bus and train and bus again, it was difficult to get there on time and then I had to leave right at the moment I was, you know, I was off with, with no real room to breathe. Um, I was also required to take a drug class at Harbor Lights at the Salvation Army building on New York Avenue in Northeast, which uh, forced me to have to leave two and a half to three hours early from work uh, each week in order to make it there on time and it was a hike. Um, I was told that lateness to the program by the facilitator would not be tolerated and would subject me to injunctions such as the loss of the privilege of even being able to leave the whole village premises, which would automatically cause me to lose my job, you know, if I can't go to work. I was in a very preca precarious and uncomfortable position, which I felt was causing me to make unreasonable demands on an employer who hired a convicted felon. Um, when I received my first paycheck, I was told that I'd have to pay a subsistence of 25% of my gross pay. Um, which would continue until my official release date, even though I would not be 
housed at Hope Village. Um, this was a lot, in my opinion, considering that I was in essence starting over from ground zero, trying to find housing for myself and my children, and uh, not to mention the other expenses that are incurred simply by virtue of having a family. Um, I talked to my counselor, Mr. Tyson, and my case manager <coughs> at Hope Village, and they explained to me that I would be able to get my subsistence reduced or even waived if I you know, navigated another set of appropriate channels, which I did, and after making several payments and inquiries, I was shuffled around yet again. Um, uh, I'm not going to continue to go into the issues. I see my time is winding down. Uh, I found a lot of the procedures difficult and some contrary to, um, to one another. And it was a tough impediment for me, but I was lucky to have a strong support system in my family and great community resources. Unfortunately, most people in that situation don't have those, and for them it can be very frustrating um, and cause them to lose sight of really what, you know, what their ultimate goal is. Um, but when the policies are enforced correctly and on a case-by-case -case basis, ha halfway houses like Hope Village are a great benefit and useful to those coming back into society and need help making their way. I personally was grateful for that opportunity to spend the last leg of my incarceration at Hope Village, getting, you know, setting myself up for the rest of my life. Uh, I'm proud to report that I've been uh, gainfully employed at the same location since my third week at Hope Village, and I'm only a few short weeks away from becoming a licensed realtor, so I'd like to think that I'm one of the successful 1,157 uh, people that was released from Hope Village in 2009, and I look forward to, you know, continuing this in this path. 